we're going to be better as a movement if Heritage and all organizations, organization leaders, are willing at least to talk to one another. Because I recognize that some people, some conservatives now say civil discourse with the left is gone. I don't think civil discourse, if if that happens to be true, and I'm not sure that it is, should be gone inside conservatism. Mm -hmm. And and that is a real high priority of mine. I'm never going to change I mean, about that because I'm a teacher at heart. I'm a Socratic teacher at heart. I love conversations. I love the debate. And that's really the key point, mm -hmm. which is that as conservatives, we have to be more comfortable having civil disagreement about some of these, these, these uh, real flashpoints. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and this week I'm joined by no one except for our guest later, obviously, but uh, Nick had to uh, trapeze out to Harper's Ferry to get his heart broken again by trying to buy a house. Uh, so hopefully uh, that went well, um, but we have on uh, one of the few repeat guests on Moment of Truth today, the great uh, Dr. Kevin Roberts, who has gotten a bit of a promotion, uh, he might even he might not even characterize it that way, but we certainly think so. Uh, since he last came on last May, uh, just about a year ago, he is now the president of the Heritage Foundation, um, and we had a fantastic conversation, diving deep on everything he's doing there. And I really got to push him a little bit on each of the issues that I know all of you care about: trade, immigration, foreign policy, so on. Um, you know, Kevin does a little bit of a, a confessions of an ex neocon on on the podcast. Um, you know, he's really moving the ball forward, I think, the Heritage Foundation, making them newly relevant in these fights that are happening in the conservative movement. And they've put real skin in the game in terms of actually putting their money where their mouth is, not just making rhetorical concessions to our faction of the right, but also, um, you know, leading on on major votes. Um, uh, just the night that we were taping the uh, U.S. House of Representatives, uh, 57 Republicans voted against this $40 billion boondoggle aid package for Ukraine that's going to do nothing to advance peace. It's just a, a boondoggle for the NGocracy. Um, and uh, Heritage is getting a lot of heat for it um, uh, by, by the usual suspects, the neocons. And uh, and so, but we're really proud that they decided to take a, a strong stand there. Uh, I think, you know, an article in National Review even quoted our support specifically because apparently we're the crazy, scary people in town. So, um, really interesting episode. I think you'll get an insight onto where Kevin's head's at, uh, where he's trying to move the Heritage Foundation. And uh, um, for all the creepy journalists that are like, oh, you know, the Heritage Foundation is now evil, fascist, Nazi, whatever. Um, enjoy digging through this episode to try and find something that you think you can hang your hat on. Um, uh, you know, thank you for being listeners A Moment of Truth. But uh, Kevin is, is a dear friend. Um, we're extremely proud of the job he's doing at the Heritage Foundation. And we think that um, he is he's one of the leaders in D.C. moving the ball forward at this point. Um, in, a, in a different way than, say, American Moment is. Um, again, uh, leading a large institution is a unique challenge, but we think he's he's set to, to it. Uh, we're, we're excited to have a, a reinforcement up here in D.C. We're sorry he had to leave Texas, obviously, because uh, it's certainly a more pleasant place to live than the swamp. But we had a fantastic time talking to him for a wide ranging discussion. Hope you guys will listen to the end. Um, thank you for listening, as always. And we'll go now to Dr. Kevin Roberts. Dr. Roberts, thank you for coming on the podcast. So Rob Sharma, thanks for having me. Uh, you're back about a year, exactly a year That's since you were here believe, last. Man. And uh, not much has gone on in your personal life, right? <laughs> Things are roughly the same. Still enjoying Austin, Texas? Yeah, in my mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm the crazy guy who uprooted his family from the free state of Texas to the swamp. But yeah. here I am. And actually, all kidding and sarcasm aside. I'm privileged and very joyful to be here. Yeah, you're 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 one of a handful of people I I know that did the the red state to blue state state migration yeah. in the last year year and a half, and uh, uh, everyone thinks we're insane. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. what's that been like? What are you here to do for those of our guests that are that are not familiar? Well, much to my surprise, I was hired as the seventh president of the Heritage Foundation, and it was to my surprise because. I was having a great time leading the Texas Public Policy Foundation, a friend of heritage for sure. And I just thought that a guy who wanted to come in and celebrate heritage's great history by amplifying its work at the state levels, all the state capitals eventually, by having a certain skepticism, if not hostility toward the centralized power in DC, might not be the guy who would be hired. And very much, not just to my pleasure, but it, it seems as if pleasure of the board, 
all of my colleagues, a growing number of people in the movement. And I really don't want to sound like I'm trying to take credit for this, Sir Rob. The institution deserves credit. Things are going really well. Um, I think the greatest testament to that, to sum up here, as I walk through our building every day that I'm in town mm -hmm. and not out fundraising or, or you know giving a talk around the country is, Kevin, we're having fun. We're, we're putting lead on the target. And for this bird hunter to hear that lead's being put on the target <laughs> is really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're back here, so you've been doing a good job. Uh, we, would, we would not have done so without that. That's true, that. <laughs> because even though we're friends, you, you hold me to a high threshold. That's right. It's important, good and bad. Um, what uh, what's that process been like? I mean, you, you you came up through initially academia and then into state politics, which is a very unique scene, even in Texas, which is sort of the biggest pond to play in for the right in the country. What's different up here, good and bad? Well, a lot is different. I mean, first, it, it, the obvious I should state is just the scale of it, right? And, but I think maybe adding some color, some texture to the difference in scale is important. And your your point is correct about Texas. Obviously, people understand how big it is. But when you think about the Texas legislature, its influence, not just over policy in Texas, obviously, but the disproportionate influence that Texas policy or California policy or Florida policy has on the country is very obvious. All that to say, the scale of the problems in DC mm -hmm make the problems in Austin where power is centralized seem like single A baseball. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that I knew, but until you're here living it mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how to marshal resources mm -hmm. against that centralized yeah. power is different. Well, and also like white papers about nuclear weapons are different than white papers about copper pennies. <laughs> that's, that's, that's exactly right. And, and that was going to be my second point that while the work that all of these state-based groups is very important, the work of Heritage and other groups with a, a fuller issue set dealing with not just national issues, but international issues kind of goes straight to how we're going to survive as a people, right? And so that scale is also different. But the third thing I would say, and this is in the Pleasant Surprise Department, that although I knew some of this because I know you, I know some good members in the House and Senate who are good guys and gals, the number of people in this town the devil city, as Ronald Reagan would call it, mm -hmm. who are right-minded. Call it on the Potomac. But yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah oh, I guess it's for later in the conversation. Uh, you're going to make me lose my train of thought after a long day. But, no, the number of people who are good-willed, right-minded, willing to have a conversation, and who want to take our country back is a very large number. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why you do the work you do, and I do the work I do, and our friends do the work they do. But it's been a pleasant surprise. Unpleasant surprise is how inertia actually governs this town. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked to one relatively conservative outlet this week, and they said, you know, what's your diagnosis after being six months on the job of, of DC? And I said, this belief that the system's broken, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And the hostility that so many people in this town have toward those of us who would say, on behalf of the American people, we've had enough mm -hmm. and we want our country back. Mm -hmm. But when you say inertia, I mean, that, that it's sort of a, a value-free term. Inertia could inure to our benefit. It could inure to our downside. I mean, mm -hmm. inertia when it's, you know, that crank in the White House and, you know, Democrats controlling both chambers of Congress may be a good thing or maybe a bad thing uh, when when we actually do have the opportunity to govern. I mean, what 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 specifically? Because it's it's almost, you know, a cliche at this point that that D.C. runs like, you know, you know, cold lead through a pipe. But, but what, what specifically is the problem with it? Yeah. Well, your intellectual ability to have a deep conversation about laws of physics is greater than mine. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm going to step out of this metaphor about inertia. And, and you know, just, just well, I'm not kidding about yeah. your intellectual capability. But the point is, to be specific, it's that, well, I'll be more than specific. I'll be very candid. K Street lobbyists run this country. Mm -hmm. They run domestic policy. They run foreign policy. Mm -hmm. I've had enough. <laughs> Is that clear enough? <laughs> yes, that, that 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 makes more sense. Tell us what that means, because one of the most interesting things that I learned um, over the last one to two years uh, being involved in this space is that, yes, the K Street lobbies have a real influence, but most people assume that that influence is directly a relationship between K Street and, um, and, uh, and the members of Congress and the federal government. Uh, but that relationship also exists between uh, what we think of as mission-driven 501c3 organizations. It also exists with uh, otherwise ideologically motivated people. I mean, this was a big uh, narrative that that it, that was uh, around last year, and and Heritage decided to that enough was enough. You know, big tech companies were giving gobs and gobs mm -hmm. of money to to 
conservative nonprofits because they recognized that there was a way to launder their corporate agenda into an ideological one. So, so how does K Street's influence actually work in this town? Well, it, it is, it's complicated, but I can explain at least parts of it very simply. K Street lobbyists, to state the obvious, have gobs of money, mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of dollars, if not the low billions, if you start calculating it. And that, that would be a, a more accurate estimate, low billions. And what they do is actually set the policy. So I think what a, a lot of Americans across the political spectrum think about DC inertia is that there's this strange amalgam of members of Congress, their staff, committee staff, and K Street lobbyists, and they get together and they come up with these bad ideas. Actually, it's worse than that. Now, by the way, I'm an optimist, so I think we're going to solve this. But mm -hmm. you know, the first part of optimism is recognizing the problem mm -hmm. in front of you. K Street lobbyists actually make everything happen. They write the bills. They set the terms of the debate, as we saw recently with the so-called Ukrainian aid package. That was set before members of Congress even knew that it was coming up. That isn't just a leadership issue. It isn't just an establishment issue. It's a K Street lobbyist issue. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing that I'll introduce to this conversation, because it is a high priority of mine and a high priority of heritage now, is that the Chinese communists have infiltrated K Street. And we will see, unfortunately, over the next six to 12 months, especially if conservatives come to power in a year, that the number of elected members of Congress who are conflicted because of K Street money that ultimately has ties to the CCP is very high. And I lament that. I, I don't I don't celebrate that about people on our side. I don't celebrate that, believe it or not, mm -hmm. about members on the other side, because ultimately that's that's very undermining of our republic and of mm -hmm. our American ideals. But to, to stay on the track here about how it works, the whole point is to make sure that there are only a few people who are controlling the levers of power. Mm -hmm. And we have an oligopoly that we have to break up. I think we have a, which also speaks to the big tech problem. We have a few election cycles, you know, maybe three to to fix this. I've, I've said publicly many times in the last two months, the window of opportunity to restore the institutions of this country is small. It is not just about elections, but as you and your colleagues speak and write about very articulately often, politics, legal power are essential parts of fixing the problem. Yeah. Um, foreign influence side is also another one of those very dark things you realize. And it's not just the Chinese, it's it's every country in the world, because why wouldn't they? Why, if you are a foreign country, recognizing the, the vast you know, wealth that the United States has to spread around the globe and the sheer power that it has, of course, you'd be foolish not to in your own interest sure. try to influence American politics. The mistake is on the side of the American policymakers who t who are cheap dates and who, who easily um, render themselves subservient to those foreign interests. I agree with that entirely. Yeah. So not to be dismissive of your excellent point about the incentive, the weird incentive that, yeah. that every every nation state has, but I would emphasize and, and push not just gently, but pretty firmly and say the Chinese communists are the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, make no mistake. I would I would just defy anyone who has a would challenge that point to read Peter Schweitzer's book, mm -hmm. Red Handed. And you will see research coming out of Heritage, which through our conservative oversight project, we'll name names. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't name those names whenever we have the opportunity mm -hmm. to do so and show the extent to which the Chinese Communist Party has infiltrated the halls of power in this country, mm -hmm. we will lose this republic. Mm -hmm. I didn't move from Texas to let that happen. Yeah. So the China issue is, I think, a very good uh, example of broader shifts that are happening in the conservative movement and in political priorities in the country more broadly. I mean, I, I would say that some Democrats have woken up on the China issue, and God bless them, they need to pay attention to it as well. Right. Um, what has that experience been like, being part of what is an ideological paradigm shift happening on the right, showing up in some ways at the beginning of it, in some ways at the middle of it, in some ways at the end of it? Um, how have you thought about that uh, in terms of the fights you pick, the fights you don't pick, the coalitions you have to build, the old coalitions that no longer suffice? Yeah, boy, in a lot of ways, Sarab, that's the question that mostly implicitly, but sometimes explicitly, I and my my key staff at Heritage grapple with every day. And and let me just sort of give you a, one caveat or, or maybe an introduction to the, the real response. It's going to sound like I think that we think Heritage has all the answers. That's not what I mean. Mm -hmm. What I mean is we understand the influence we have. Mm -hmm. And we understand that the movement is shifting and that there are people who 
some of whom have been longtime friends of Heritage who wonder what our influence is like. I get all that. All of that to say that we grapple with that question because we want to have as much influence as we can. Mm -hmm. First of all, with the movement, because those are our people. Mm -hmm. The movement is more fractured than it's ever been in my adult life. Mm -hmm. I think it probably was more fractured when I was a child in the 1970s, but say, you know, for half a century. Uh, this is th th this is where we are. But for heritage in particular, we're trying to make sure that as we have a high priority of recohering the movement, that that is done so not by us, especially I, wagging a finger and saying, you know, you're you're wrong about that. You're 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 violating the heritage position on that. But instead, having conversations mm -hmm. and. That sounds a little trite. In fact, it sounds even, you know, maybe too too meek. But what I mean by that is we're going to be better as a movement if Heritage and all organizations, organization leaders, are willing at least to talk to one another. Because I recognize that some people, some conservatives now say civil discourse with the left is gone. I don't think civil discourse, if if that happens to be true, and I'm not sure that it is, should be gone inside conservatism. Mm -hmm. And and that is a real high priority of mine. I'm never going to change I mean, about that because I'm a teacher at heart. I'm a Socratic teacher at heart. I love conversations. I love the debate. And that's really the key point, mm -hmm. which is that as conservatives, we have to be more comfortable having civil disagreement about some of these, these, these uh, real flashpoints. At Heritage, that means we have to be sure that we adopt what I call a customer service attitude, that we have a lot of material assets. They are not infinite, believe it or not, but there <laughs> are a lot of material assets. We have first and foremost, tremendous intellectual talent there. We want to be sure that we're involved in those conversations that matter for the future. I'm sure you will probe about some of the particular issues, but I think it's really important for me to hang on this point mm -hmm. and emphasize the mindset that we have at Heritage, mm -hmm. that we really need to be outward looking, hands open to the movement. Mm -hmm. What can we do to serve you? How can you help us be better? I think we have had some early victories. Mm -hmm. And by victories, I mean, you know, unfortunately not legislative victories, although we have had a couple of those. We've we've killed some bad things. Yeah. But far more important victories to sum up here in this conversation thread would be conversations with other movement leaders that, for whatever reason, weren't happening uh, before I got there. So hats off, not just to my colleagues at Heritage, but especially, as they would say, to our colleagues across the movement who are willing to be engaged with us. Mm -hmm. You said that the conservative movement is fractured more than it ever has been, but that's sort of a there's an element missing from from that, and that's a, a noun and a verb. You know, someone fractured it, and they fractured it for yeah, you know, they, they they fractured it for a reason. Um, why do you think the conservative movement is fractured? What 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 and and you know what were the good reasons to do so, and what were maybe the bad reasons to do so? Well, the conservative movement has. A natural tension inside it. Mm -hmm. It always has, in in my lifetime. So in in uh, recent American history since uh, the 1960s, that classic fissure is between fiscal conservatives and social conservatives. That's still very present. Um, you know, you could you can see evidence of that all the time, but there's a far more profound and actually intellectually serious fissure mm -hmm. that's even more intentional. It's more thoughtful. That's not to say that the previous fissure had no thought in it. Mm -hmm. But this one is very intentional because I think what people see, people on the right see, is some of them, that the American ideal, the very reason that those of us who are call ourselves patriots say so, is not even worth adhering to. Mm -hmm. And these these are conservatively minded people. They mm -hmm. go about their lives that way. And so they would like to completely reestablish, reorder American institutions. And this is what Gordon Wood wrote about in his Pulitzer Prize winning history and very fine history of the American Revolution when he talked about the radicalism of the revolution. It wasn't the radicalism that might meet the eye, the violence, et cetera, in terms of warfare. It was the radicalism of completely upending old institutions and establishing new ones. Mm -hmm. This is the point, Sarab. That's a very intentional project. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the good elements of that are that as a bit of an intellectual historian, that rebirthing of, of our movement happens about twice a century. It's healthy, it's good, especially if the discourse can be at least respectful mm -hmm. of some differences. I'm not sure that ours always is. Yeah. Um, I find that 
pretty abhorrent, frankly. Mm-hmm. And not just because I lead heritage, I just think it's unproductive. So, mm-hmm. you know, let's let's have the confidence and the spine mm-hmm. to be use a polite metaphor mm-hmm. uh, to to sit around and air our differences of opinion without thinking that, you know, uh, someone shouldn't even be around the table. But the the so the good part of it is is the rebirth. The bad part is that conversation is happening in what I would argue is a very prolonged way when policymakers need us to be advising them on what the proper way forward is. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be in a wilderness Mm -hmm. as a country, even if we have a conservative majority in both houses of Congress Mm -hmm. next year Mm -hmm. for two and a half more years. Mm -hmm. We have to take that time, and I believe we have that time, as conservatives to the extent we can put together a policy agenda that represents principles on which we have 75, 80% agreement. If we don't do that, we're going to miss, I think, the last opportunity in this country's history Mm -hmm. to save the American Republic. I'm an optimist, not a fatalist, as you know, but I think that's what's at stake. And now, if I may, with a friend and a friendly audience, (laughs) air of frustration. Okay. I hear a lot of criticisms about legacy institutions. And yet, when my colleagues and I are walking the halls of Congress, I don't see many other conservatives. I don't see many other representatives who are of the movement, who are good people, who are very vocal on Twitter, who are even trolls on Twitter. They're arguing for good policy mm-hmm. and against bad policy. Put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. And I don't say that to you. Yeah. I'm looking at you saying <laughs> that. I mean that as a brother in the movement. Yeah. And I think that perhaps very early in my tenure as president of the Heritage Foundation, we may, my colleagues and I, may have earned the opportunity to say that, not out of arrogance, certainly not out of thinking we're perfect or that I am, but out of the reality that I can already count several instances of we, with just a couple of other conservative organizations, being the only ones in the trenches holding the line. That's not gonna work for our conservative movement, and I would just encourage all of us to be better. Yeah. No, I I entirely agree with that. And it's one of the most frustrating parts of at least the job that I do is that, you know, uh, maybe being an organization that identifies more with with the dissidents in the space who, who found the old conservative movement unsatisfactory is that, you know, we now get accused of of selling out because we are here. Um, and it's like, OK, <laughs> like there's not. It's there are the logical there, consequences. There, there, of the there cannot be a virtue in just self-aggrandizement, in yeah, just right. being a sort of making an idol out of how great your own ideas are, but not actually having any impact. That can't be the way that policy and politics is done. And so, um, you know, again, it's uh, I think that that movements earn the right to, um, you know, make the justifiable concessions that actually being part of the process of wielding and using power is and uh you know to the extent that legacy institutions lost that credibility it right. was for good reasons but that people who claim to be reformers should be given a chance and i think you've done a very good job so far um, well i was as you know not not trying to elicit that that praise but mm-hmm. just to say in in what i find to be a very comfortable forum mm-hmm. because of our friendship which includes the candor that comes with yeah. friendship right both ways yeah. but also you know knowing Many people in your audience, you know, I'm a listener, um, <laughs> that I, I I feel comfortable airing that, knowing I think to the point you just made, people know I'm not condemning anybody. Mm-hmm. Heritage is not condemning anybody. I'm just saying we and others in this city, mm-hmm. which unfortunately has a disproportionate amount of power, this mm-hmm. city, we're fighting the good fight and we're very happy to hear about th- ways we can be better, mm-hmm. but we need people to arrive to help us fight the fight so mm-hmm. that these mostly intellectual conversations mm-hmm. about the future of conservatism actually matter. Now you're saying we can't just write essays at each other until we all die? <laughs> from, from this PhD, that's exactly what I'm saying. Now you decided now to. Now you're trying to trigger me. <laughs> no, I mean, this is, I, I think I literally tweeted this this morning because I, I saw some disagreement on the internet and I was like, you know, just we're, we're all just going to write essays at each other until we all die. And yeah. that's, that's going to be fine. I mean, we're, we're going to, uh, maybe they'll give us pen and paper in the gulag <laughs> so we can keep doing it. But I think. <laughs> it worked for Thomas More. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, until they, until they decapitate us. So, okay, let's, let's get down into the practical questions mm. here um, because for, appropriate reasons we haven't been naming names 
on all of the figures that frustrate uh, us, but uh, I think we can name names on specific policy issues um, and in, in terms of what those issues are. So let's start with foreign policy. You mm. mentioned the Ukraine aid package. Mm. Um, when President Trump was elected in 2015-16, he was one person on stage who said the Iraq war was a mistake um, and that we should end endless wars. Um, uh, no one else on that stage agreed with him except for Rand Paul, who is patriotically just today um, standing against the, uh, the, the package and holding it up in the Senate. How have you thought about where the conservative movement needs to adjust its approach on foreign policy? This is personal for me because, as I think I mentioned the first time I was with you, I'm a recovering neocon. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, I'd subscribe to the Weekly Standard. Um, I, I thought that the publishers of that were the bee's knees intellectually. I thought that- That aged like milk. <laughs> yes, that's correct. The, the, the president at the time, who was something of a hero for many of us, after 9-11, of course, whom I still respect. The, 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 the shine proved to be very short-lived. Mm -hmm. And that approach was folly. And I was dead wrong. And let me tell you, Sir Rob, I, you know, in, in, in academic settings, in settings like this, early days of conservative podcasting, I went to the mat for neoconservatism. That's who I was. And so I say that hopefully to show the intellectual honesty yeah. that I think, the, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, I'm just Me, saying- Mea culpa. I, yeah, <laughs> three, like in, in Holy Mass, three times. Mm -hmm. uh, but that we have to get past that mm -hmm. as a movement. It is not appropriate. It is not effective for American foreign policy to invert the questions we need to be asking. The purpose of American foreign policy, first and foremost, is to ask the question, what serves the interests of the American people? And generally, if I now, with my revelation, which has evolved, uh, especially over the last five to eight years, and certainly helped with the clarity of that moment you cited of President Trump, or then candidate Trump on the stage, Re go back, you know, with with that vantage of hindsight, I realized, gosh, that was true for a very long time, mm -hmm. and it's part of the problem about K Street lobbyists. It's part of the problem about this this whole debate or lack thereof over the Ukraine package. But to drive to the, to the point that I, I think you want me to get to, I think the future of our movement hinges upon us recognizing that there is a way. There is a you know I might call a third way between the old Reagan coalition, I don't mean that pejoratively, it was appropriate at the time because of the threat of communism by the Soviets, of spending a lot on foreign aid being even interventionist. Obviously vestiges of that lasted into the early part of the 21st century. And our, our friends, perhaps you're in, in this camp, which is fine, certainly wanting more restraint, uh, people who might even call themselves isolationists, as a historian of this republic, I don't use the word isolationist to be pejorative. Mm -hmm. I think that's an example of one of the things we need to get out of the habit of mm -hmm. as conservatives is don't, don't denigrate people who are in that camp. There's a third way, which is we can borrow the best elements of both of those. And mm -hmm. I actually think that President Trump was doing a pretty good job of that. I think historically, he will be judged very well by the few remaining intellectually honest mm -hmm. historians. So for us as historians, and especially for us at Heritage, because we cover every issue in domestic policy and foreign policy, that's a shift, mm -hmm. right? And it's a shift that where the rubber meets the road, if I may, just to talk a little bit about inside baseball, the kinds of conversations that we're having very collegially inside Heritage is cultivating a sense between our, our policy experts who work on fiscal matters and our policy experts who work on military and foreign policy matters. And they have the charge from me and our new executive vice president, Derek Morgan, longtime Heritage alum I recruited back, to say, look, we're all for a very strong American military. That's in the interest of the American people. What we're not for is intervening everywhere around the world or recklessly with no debate, no committee debate, not even seeing the text for even five hours, spending $40 billion on a perfectly good and noble objective, which is helping the heroic Ukrainians without putting in priority mm -hmm. what our priorities actually are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of, of legacy that this emerging conservative consensus can have. I know that it's very discouraging as you and I sit here that 
it's only Senator Rand Paul who is being as vocal as he is in the Senate. There are others who agree with him. You and I know that, mm -hmm. but hats off to him. But I think that by virtue of a handful of us on our side poking our heads up and saying, the system's broken, we've got to change it. Mm -hmm. The next package that comes up, and mm -hmm. you and I both know there will be one, we need to defeat mm -hmm. because that's in the best interest of the American people. Unless, unless by some stroke of fortune, the leadership in Congress decide we actually are going to use the system that our founders put in place and we're going to have committee debates and we're going to have honest intellectual debate about what that money is being used for and why. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the rubber meeting the road on, on practical issues. And this is why, you know, for instance, to uh, day before yesterday, Heritage Action put out a vote recommendation against the Ukraine aid package. I thought that was excellent. Um, you know, it's one, one of the interesting challenges that I know my friends that identify more with realism and restraint, which is where I am. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the concerns is that uh, we'll play a, we'll play a game of names over the next five to 10 years where we'll all say we are, you know, realists or that we believe in a, a foreign policy that puts America first or in the national mm -hmm. interest, uh, but that practically nothing will change mm -hmm. in the way that we advocate um, uh, uh, on policy grounds. And so mm -hmm. if there is Three, it's a legitimate concern. Right. I mean, yeah. entryism is always a part of the problem. I mean, it's, yeah. you find me in a, a Republican in America today that doesn't run on the term conservative Republican. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, there's not a single one. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 these labels are often tricky. It's why I'm generally not a fan of, of ism based labels because it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. But we have Europe, you have Asia and you have the Middle East. What should America's role in the world be in those three regions? Boy, that's a great question. I will miss some details here, yeah. uh, but that's okay. You know, we we have people who can who can handle the details. You'll get a sense of of my position and and uh, of heritages. And if there's something that you want me to speak to, just just probe. But uh, Europe, I think, is the priority because it is the cradle of our philosophical ideals. Mm -hmm. That's the historian in me. It's the you know the son of the Cold War speaking as well. I think to to sort of swerve down to the sidewalk level or very closely, we ought to <clears throat> ought to be investing proactively in arming our allies. I believe in a strong NATO. I know that that isn't necessarily something that those friends like you and and in your camp and foreign policy agree with. But that's the kind of proactive example that I think keeps us out of these kinds of, of uh, terrible situations like we have in, in Ukraine. In the Middle East, I think we have to be much more thoughtful, in fact, even pensive, about anything approaching intervention. And the reason is that we were culturally arrogant about being able to implant American political philosophy in cultures for better and for worse. I mean, we're all equal in God's eyes, uh, not capable at this point in history of achieving that kind of American style representative republic. That's what I thought was possible in my mm -hmm. own arrogance, and it isn't. And so I would, I would argue for a pretty significant drawback there. I think as an example, um, although we're getting into Asia here, that that uh, Trump was right about withdrawing from Afghanistan, but keeping a force of about 3,000 people in Bagram, I think that would have avoided the debacle and frankly, the historical travesty of the Biden withdrawal of Afghanistan. Um, in, let me speak though to, if I may riff a little bit, to mm -hmm. Africa and Latin America, mm -hmm. uh, both of which are very important in my own thinking because of my academic training mm -hmm. as a historian of the slave trade, you know, both, both continents tragically important in that history. There's a huge concern there and it involves Asia and it is the infiltration of the CCP mm -hmm. into the infrastructure investments, the governments. You know, we, we have the privilege of hosting a lot of heads of state, meeting with a lot of ambassadors from around the world at Heritage. And while I'll keep the off the record conversations that way I can speak to the aggregate, which is that not only is that a problem, it's it's they're so fearful of speaking about it that it continues apace, mm -hmm. the infiltration of the CCP. American foreign policy needs to put at the top of the list, the mm -hmm. priority, that the defining foreign policy issue for us mm -hmm. in the interest of the American people mm -hmm. is defeating the Chinese Communist Party. And that means not only being willing to dramatically increase our military aid, the right military aid to Taiwan, not what K Street says, mm -hmm. but also to do the same for those countries like Guatemala mm -hmm. in Latin America, like Somaliland mm -hmm. in Africa, who are willing to fight them.
Mm -hmm. But those countries in Latin America and Africa specifically, the, there's no hot war likely to come to their shores uh, between the United States and China. The no, offer that's being put before them is uh, you know, the sort of NGO State yeah, Department apparatus right. on the American side that wants to push particular cultural values right. um, on, on them. And, uh, you know, in their eyes, those nice Chinese diplomats coming to build them a port. That's right. The calculation they're making, I would say right now we're on the bad side of. We, oh, yeah. we, we're not poised to win that calculation for poor countries that just want infrastructure. Well, un until and unless our State Department stops spending tens of billions of dollars, if not a few hundred billion dollars, on what is a woke agenda. I mean, I know that sounds like very trite, overused phrase, <laughs> but that is what it is. And, and your framing is very astute. Having said that, I don't think that's a lost cause. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the oversight authority that Congress has, especially the House, if you think about what can happen if we have a conservative majority in the House and Senate and there's actual political courage to pursue that, there can be at least a slowing down of that and a signal to those would-be allies on, on matters of rejecting CCP investment and in infrastructure vis-a-vis -vis the, the Belt and Road Initiative, real success even before January 2025. But I, I guess the point is adhering to, as you know, what I call radical incrementalism in policy we can at least go get some bunt singles between mm -hmm. now and 2025. And, and, and that can look as simple as, or be as simple as members of the United States Senate saying, when we're back in power of the executive branch, this is what's stopping. There is enough courage among the leaders of the aforementioned countries and others to hold the line on those things. But to, very much to your point, they're just looking for some signal from the United States that we're not always gonna be the bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, but the the focus of uh you know that that concern is china and and i would say that china intertangles deeply with the third broad category of issues that i would say define you know at least our heresies at american moment and that's economics um what do you you're see you're an economic heretic <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> something like that um uh you know th there's many elements to what this means it can mean our trade policy, it can mean things like welfare, it can mean um, uh, even the ways we think about domestic industrial production. How are you thinking about the ways that the, the right needs to update its thinking on economics? Well, my my new colleague and and longtime acquaintance, Roger Severino, who's, who's back at Heritage as the vice president of our domestic policy, one of the most senior positions in our organization, says it really well. And keep in mind, Roger's job is to help articulate our policy on all of domestic policy, including economic matters, fiscal matters. So he's got a really big staff of really smart people. He says it well when he says, we have a tendency or we've had a tendency in American conservatism since the late 50s, early 60s, 1950s, early 1960s, to think of humans as economic beings first, when in fact, as, as I know from my reading, for example, of the, the early free market work of the monks of Salamanca in the 1200s, <laughs> and in fact, we're, but I won't go all academic on you, that, of, and I know as an Aristotelian, to say nothing of being what I know as a Christian, we are social beings first. And the free market has emerged from that. Mm -hmm. And so as a historian, one of the things I insist on is getting our chronology right. And we're getting our chronology right Mm -hmm. in the conservative movement. I actually think in a, in a relatively short amount of time, since very thoughtful people in the movement, yourself included, said, we've, we've got to update this thinking. It's, it's not proper. We need to be thoughtful about it, respectful of others who've, who've got some differences of opinion, but we've got to get to a new understanding. We're not quite there yet as a movement, but I think we've made significant strides. And I can tell you inside Heritage, that conversation, which the world knows is happening, or the conservative world knows is happening, has been collegial. It's been well-intentioned. There are differences of opinion. At Heritage, we do have a one-voice policy. And the reason we have that is because we solicit not just great ideas and publish great ideas. We want to effect change in policy. How can you effect change in policy if one policy scholar is saying something and another is saying that? Mm -hmm. But the, the point is that as a result of, of having to develop a single voice on this, it requires a willingness to have the conversation mm -hmm. that inside the movement, 
sometimes even inside our own organizations has not happened enough. And mm. it goes back to this theme, which just sounds kind of Pollyannish of, uh, uh, of me, which is that everything can be solved with conversation. A lot can be solved and resolved with fruitful mm -hmm. conversation, where the objective is to reach a consensus. Mm -hmm. The point is, to sum up, I think as a movement, we're on the brink of that consensus. There will be outliers who say, nope, um, you know, libertarian friends, um, man is an economic being. Um, anything that happens socially is, you know, just a bonus. Uh, that is a, a just a complete fallacy. It's it's historically wrong. It's philosophically wrong. I say that respectfully, mm -hmm. but you know, part of charity is being candid, and we have to understand that Roger Severino's right. Um, thinkers for a couple thousand years are right mm -hmm. about man being a social being, and this great fruit of the dignity that comes from work, the dignity that comes from living in community, broadly understood, the free market, can continue to exist if we do those things in the right order, both individually, and by that I'm referring to the success sequence, or in terms of policy, which is remembering that it is the job of the market mm -hmm. to serve the family and the community, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Because if I may just write a postscript here, going the other way is materially deterministic, which is the, it's like the, the entrance ramp to neo-Marxism. Mm -hmm. And so philosophically, we have to be pristine in our thinking mm -hmm. and be very well aware of entrance ramps we should not take. Mm -hmm. So like with the foreign policy issue, uh, a very fine statement, um, but practical upshots. So you keep on wanting trade. me to be practical. What <laughs> <is that? laughs> Well, look, I mean, you, you decided to to come to D.C. with a Ph.D., and we just don't do that sort of stuff yeah, here I in know, terms of... No, you're, no, you're kidding. You're absolutely, I'm just, I'm just uh, kidding. Well, you're no, right. but I, I think it is helpful here because I think that, you know, what, what critics would say is that um, you can say that, you know, man is a social creature first, and we have to we have to care for their, you know, spiritual success just as much as their economic, et cetera, mm. et cetera. However, like, that is all fine and good as long as it actually affects changes on how we think about concrete policy areas. So uh, for instance, on um, on trade, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm on the record as believing that the trading policy for the last 30 to 40 years has been a disaster, that mm -hmm. we systematically need industrialize the country, um, made ourselves less secure, less prosperous, and less free in the process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with China. And I would argue that to the mm. extent that we uh, we should have um, concerns about China, that it should primarily focus on the complete lack of economic independence we have vis-a-vis -vis them, as opposed to primarily focusing on security threats. But there's a balance to be had there. W w what say you about trade? I really want to engage you on this China comment, but I'm going <laughs> to answer your, and, and I think it would mostly be agreement. Yeah. But you know there's a disagreement between yeah. us which is fine, yeah. uh, we will always be friends. The, um, on trade, I think that free trade is a noble objective. Uh, it's, it, it's certainly mine, it's certainly heritage's. The problem is that so few countries actually practice free trade, mm -hmm. and therefore they've taken advantage of America's goodwill, mm -hmm. but also you know the belief by some folks in America that we can turn other countries like communist China into looking like us. That's arrogant, I'm gonna mm -hmm. sort of go back to a point I made earlier. Trade policy, I think the default- No country with McDonald's have ever gone to war except when they started doing so about five or 10 years yeah, ago. that's right, that's right. Yeah, it's just unprecedented <laughs> until then. Um, trade policy needs to reflect the belief in the United States and in other countries that man should behave freely economically. Having said that, just to be really, really blunt, uh, the globalization project needs to come to an end. Mm -hmm. It has it not served America well, where I suspect in fact, more than suspect, I know that there is some policy daylight between you and me, which is fine, is that I wouldn't therefore say the the way the policy that should be implemented by Congress is what I think you, but certainly some of our friends call family policy, mm -hmm. because I think that that actually just continues the concentration of power in D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually dislodges, it displaces the very organic things that happen when government is out of the way. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to hang on that point because I'm not a libertarian, I'm a conservative. Mm -hmm. And that means just one of the defining characteristics of that is that trade policy, free market belief flows from getting community right first. Mm -hmm. 
more to say there, but it would be a screed about the regulatory state, which would sound far afield, but is directly <laughs> mm -hmm. related to this. You said the globalization project has to come to an end, and that that is built off of the recognition that there are things that have gone awry, off off kilter. Yeah. Do we have a job to play in not just stopping the deviation, but riding the ship by 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 returning? You know, if if if, if let's 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 put it to a concrete sentence: if we globalize too much of our supply chains. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should stop globalizing them more. Should we deglobalize them? Should we should we try to bring them back? And what are we willing to do? What is what what in your mind is appropriate to do in order to make that happen? Deglobalization sounds scary as hell. To me. <laughs> um, I have a great fear of the unknown, and I think legitimately as a conservative, Buckley, Kirk, Burke would remind us of of that caution. But let me be as specific as I can. What deglobalization sounds like to me in practice given the current political and policy situation in DC, is the creation of perhaps well-intentioned, grant that, well-intentioned programs to fix it. When in fact, I have such a faith in the American people still, mm -hmm. and I have such a confidence because of what history tells me of what happens when you let a free people be mm -hmm. free, that in fact, the best path to deglobalization, mm -hmm. not to be dismissive toward your idea, mm -hmm. is letting people do that. Mm -hmm. Are there some discrete policies we need to change? You know, certain trade agreements with countries. Sure, that's that's the kind of thing that I think you'll see Heritage be much more explicit on uh, or working on. Mm -hmm. But let me be really specific and invite a dynamic that's extraordinarily relevant and we've not mentioned in the concept of the Green New Deal. You know, basically, people, your listeners, need to understand if if they've not connected these dots mm -hmm. in spite of their their intellect that globalization. The Green New Deal, climate change is all about, they're all connected, and mm -hmm. it's all about continuing the project of globalization. Mm -hmm. It's n very little, if anything, to do with so-called climate change. Mm -hmm. It's not a screed against climate change, which I would be very confident to do, mm -hmm. but it is actually more relevant to the conversation mm -hmm. thread you and I are having. Mm -hmm. If the United States wants to correct the over the excesses of globalization that have harmed communities, that have in fact deindustrialized very important communities in this country, the best way it can do so is to reject the ill fruit, the rotten fruit of the Green New Deal, not just domestically, but in the so-called investments mm -hmm. we're making around the world. Mm -hmm. To go back to your point about some of the woke agenda of the State mm -hmm. Department. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Green New Deal side of it is very interesting because I remember when, when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez first unveiled it, um, one of my Board members actually made a very good point, which is, you know, he regularly has phone calls with members of Congress, and um, you know, they, they they ask him for advice on how. It's actually it was Ryan Gerdusky. He wrote the "They're Not Listening" book on, very the, good. on the Nationalist Populist Revolution, and he he has a standard riff, which is um, when Republican members of Congress call him, he asks, uh, "What's your vision? What's your vision for the country in five years, in ten years, in fifty? Uh, and they start drooling. They they have no idea how mm -hmm. to answer that question because it's not a question that they have been taught to even ask. That's right. AOC has a, an answer for it. And, she does. And yes, there is the dystopic vision that, that we recognize is reality, but there's also those Art Deco posters that she's generated yeah. for it that look great. I mean, th th there is an aesthetic, a cohesive aesthetic uh, and, and moral vision to her view of the world that most conservatives seem unable to fathom for some good reasons, a view of pluralism that is appropriate. Um, but also, I would argue for reasons of imaginative poverty <laughs> like they yeah that's and, right. and 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 that's 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 one of the things that i find frustrating is that um you know the closest thing we ever got to it was like the contract for america in the 1990s and that's yeah. why every time we come up with a new policy agenda or try to every five years some tweak on that exact word because we're because we're we're trying to 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 go back to that that one moment where it felt like we had that agenda how, how do you think about that man that's another astute comment and if, if you weren't being astute, I would say that too. So I really mean that. <laughs> well, uh, there are a lot of ways I would like to react to that, but I, I just just per, just stick with me for a minute here. Mm -hmm. My initial reaction is is twofold. The first is in my lifetime, there have been only two instances, and you cite one, the contract with America, when I thought have thought the conservatives were being imaginative, to mm -hmm. to borrow the phrase of T. S. Eliot and Kirk. The other was Reagan. Reagan was a master of of painting a vision, and it wasn't just because he was a good communicator and a and a and a decent actor. It's because he believed it. 
I mean, to his core, that actually is why people love Reagan is mm-hmm. that he's had this optimism, but it wasn't this hollow optimism mm-hmm. that Pete, you, you and, and folks in your generation very rightly are skeptical of, mm-hmm. as, as you should be. It, it helps those of us who are generation Xers to-, yeah. to uh, Well, it's the distinction optimism. between op- optimism and boomerism. Yeah, right? that's like, exactly right. That's um, exactly right. I, you know, my, my standard riff on this is that there there are two false paths. One is, is boomerism, the idea, oh, a moral arc of the universe long bends towards justice, everything will be fine, we're all patriots, silent majority, blah. No. Like at the end of the day, like there, there, there is no reason to believe that victory is predetermined. That's, That's a very silly, most devastating critique of that I've ever heard. <laughs> well, but it's it's yeah. it's it's so endemic. Um, it is, you know. Uh, and then the other thing that is also wrong uh, is is a doomerism, you know, to to, mm-hmm. to create a mirror, which is all's lost. You know, there's no point engaging in politics. Our enemies are too strong. We're going to lose. It's something in between. And and yeah. in this, you and I's riff is exactly the same. You say three election cycles. I say it'll be the actions of individual people working together in the next five to ten years that will yeah. determine if we have a country at all. <laughs> yeah. Um. It's 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 the same time horizon that we think about it. A decisively medium term project. Yeah. Um, that's right. Violent agreement on that. Yeah. And and so thank you for that that interjection because it helps to clarify the next point I want to make, which hopefully actually is an answer to your great question. And and that is my vision, which I think is Heritage's vision, maybe, you know, what's the conservative consensus vision, has to be focused on self-governance. Mm-hmm. Abstract concept, but very real, practical, even measurable ways if, if we're willing to track them. Mm-hmm. And we have to, by the end of the 2020s, let's mm-hmm. say, to take a, a medium term mm-hmm. horizon, say that on January 1st, 2030, we look back and say, oh, since 2022, even though we have more work to do, we actually have through policy work, through a restoration of more federalism, through dismantling the regulatory state, ending the US Department of Education, begun to see Americans have more self-governance. And so just to use what I hope would be a hypothetical, if there would be a pandemic on the order of COVID, (laughs) that actually more Americans are pushing Mm -hmm. back against that earlier Mm -hmm. in the pandemic, Mm -hmm. rather than just acquiescing as Mm -hmm. a majority of Americans did. That kind of positive vision is something that only a few policymakers are going to be able to do because, mm-hmm. and for good and for bad, you know, the good is they're focused on the tactical policy steps that need to be made. But the the leaders of our movement, the leaders of our country, I would submit, who we will recognize, say in 2050, we'll say those are the guys and gals who led us out of the wilderness. They're going to be the ones who articulate a vision that is clarifying, it's cohering for the movement, and then ultimately, therefore, the country. Yeah. In that movement, um, there, there's going to always be a variety of perspectives on on what the future looks like. Sure. Um, but I think the the one that has struck everyone as as quite compelling is what Mr. Ron DeSantis is doing down in Florida. Um, that has been in my political lifetime, uh, the most authentic expression of what living under right-wing governance would look like, mm-hmm. uh, much more than anything you and I ever experienced in Texas, I would say. And, and you I and agree I are, with you 100%. are both on the record, um, yeah. and uh, and you have been freed uh, as of late to be even more on the record of our frustrations with what Texas legislature is often- You've noticed that. Do. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, and in fact, you did it even in your last few months at TPPF, which I appreciated. Um, but there, there, yes, there is a self-government aspect to what Ron DeSantis has done in Florida, where mm. he has returned power to the people um, uh, 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 that that would otherwise inure to to the state government. Mm. There's also an aspect where he has applied power in order to make life in Florida better. Excellent. Point. Um, and uh, you know, if the pandemic analogy is on the table, I would argue that yes, you know, lifting state mandated COVID restrictions is important. I would argue that just as much of living in what feels like normal civilization, which is what I think the American people have earned, is saying, sorry, uh, corporate uh, mandates uh, where every building you enter that's not a federal building, you have to put on a mask Mm -hmm. or the requirements that you have to be vaccinated with a vaccine you may not want to uh, take in order to be employed basically anywhere. That that is equally a part of what not only the base wants, but what would be right and just as part of that governing agenda. Self-government's an easy argument. What what are the applications of power that have to be part of it as well? Yeah, let me first of all agree with you that this, Governor DeSantis should be applauded for a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he's he's 
the leading governor right now in, in, in terms of, of Im implementing conservative vision. But the thing I really want to emphasize is you're totally right that he is doing something that far too many Republican governors have been unwilling to do, and that's wield the power they have. I think one of the great lessons that I've taken from what's called the new right collectively is that it isn't just our project isn't just about returning power to the people, mm -hmm. but that we have a lot of corrections to make mm -hmm. policy wise, but also, I mean, even like philosophically, Sarab, mm -hmm. and what DeSantis is getting at by taking on Disney, no political consultant would have told mm -hmm. him to do that, would have advised him to do that, is wielding the power he has. Mm -hmm. He happens to know he has it, not by polls, mm -hmm. but because he understands what his people believe. And not just mm -hmm. his people being conservatives, mm -hmm. but just common sense people. And I would just say for any libertarian friends listening to this, mm -hmm. if I may take a 35 second tangent, <laughs> Please. it is remarkable to me in a negative way that our applause of DeSantis leading the effort to end the corporate subsidies, what libertarians mm -hmm. rightly call crony corporatism, is somehow no longer celebrated by li mm -hmm. some libertarians when that is the ultimate objective of libertarians mm -hmm. to level the playing field. Why? Because they're far more interested, this is all relevant, mm -hmm. to celebrating a disordered understanding of mm -hmm. marriage in the human person. That's mm -hmm. become sort of the project for some mm -hmm. libertarians. DeSantis gets all of that. Yeah. And, and I actually think not only will he continue to be very successful politically, mm -hmm. careful to say I can't give endorsements, so it's not an endorsement, mm -hmm. It's a cultural endorsement. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of guy mm -hmm. that the great thinkers, conservative thinkers of the 20th century, I think would really be celebrating when, when they were remarking about imaginative conservatism, that mm -hmm. we have to imagine mm -hmm. a much better society. And it isn't just limited government and free market principles and deregulation. Those are means to the end. And the end is not freedom. Mm -hmm. The end is human flourishing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of policy correction that has to happen. Mm -hmm. And and some of it's, I mean, a friend of mine, actually a Heritage Action alum who's in law school now, um, uh, it, it told me this riff the other day. Um, he said, uh, you know, if you were to listen to some libertarians, especially the corporate types, uh, you would think that um, you're not allowed to do policy if you have a reason for it. That's that's essentially the argument they're making against Ron DeSantis is you can't lift a, the corporate subsidy for a reason you care about. Oh, it can only be on sort of neutral, bloodless, you know, sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, bean counter grounds. You can't you can't do it because you know that uh, this this entity or, or this this class has has you know systematically uh, been been um, you know oppressive to an entire half of the country. Um, and and I think that that's right. And and Ron DeSantis is someone who. Unlike many, it feels like uh, leading lights in in conservatism recognize that uh, politics exists, that, that it's okay to do things for yeah. political reasons, and That's it's right. and it it feels like so much of the you know almost Talmudic way we study conservatism in in Washington uh, is designed to beat that instinct out of people, yeah. to beat political instincts out of them, and some in some time and sometimes that happens in good ways, you know, in terms of oh you can't you can't be clientelist in your politics, uh, but also in bad ways, which is essentially makes us meek in the face of a left that is fully willing to use every tool available to it completely uh, and and uh, a principled walk into the gulag is something i'm not very interested in <laughs> no. um i want to go down fighting right and so the, the fourth element to this that i think ties all of it together and you know i, I i've cognized the elements of this agenda cognized. Is that really <laughs> yes absolutely okay. right. I, I i've cognized the elements of this agenda uh, you know trade immigration foreign uh, foreign policy i think have, have been three very important ones but i think the, the fourth is is culture um if there is one way that is undeniable that the country today is different than it was 40 years ago when the conservative movement was originally conceived is that conservatives went from the dominant force in cultural life to a dissident force in cultural life. Yeah, um, that's right. What is What has to change in our approach to politics to adjust for that reality? Well, the answer is controversial. Mm -hmm because of the reality of what you say. <laughs> yeah. That is that a too small number of conservatives agree with what I'm about to say. And it is that we've given up on our ultimate project, philosophically 
and in terms of policy. And that's defending who the human person is. We are literally redefining the human person. And conservatives not only have acquiesced to that, we're complicit in it. And we're complicit in it because of an egregious and tragic and evil lack of courage. And it is reprehensible to me and to all of us at Heritage mm -hmm. that there are boys and girls who are being savaged mm. physically by their own parents because of misguided policies that have the blessing of very poorly intentioned people, mm -hmm. including some in political power. Therefore, to fix that, we have to have more leaders like Governor DeSantis who understand that is not it's not only a tragedy that we reason enough to fix it, it it's evil but that we can't continue as a republic just demographically with that kind of thing going because there's yet another very related problem to that pope paul wrote about this in the 1960s to continue to be controversial in this wonderful encyclical humanae vitae and that is that people aren't having enough children mm -hmm. and until and unless the united states of america liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, people who love heritage, hate heritage, love me, hate me, recognize the reality of that. Anything we're doing in policy and in the law is useless. Mm -hmm. Well, Nick's on it. He's got one on the way. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and you, you, Michelle and I have done our fair share. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. You've got four, four correct? Yes. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, uh, of course, we're having <laughs> dinner with great friends, you know, with 12 kids. And I was thinking, man, I you know, missed, missed the boat. Um, no, you, got, you guys have done... Uh, very well, and um, I wanted to thank you for for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule to come on this Rinky Dink podcast. Um, oh gosh, I, I, this is awesome! And yeah. uh, thanks for tolerating me and, and long winded answers. And, and uh, sorry for the interjection. Well, this, is, this is the benefit of the the long form. I've been seeing you've been doing more more cable television, which I think is good because the president of Heritage should be out there yeah. uh, engaging on a daily basis with with the base. We watch a lot of television, yeah. uh, but uh, I, I'm sure that the the two to three minute segment format gets tiring after some time. Yeah, <laughs> and so uh, it's it's good. And I think you have a podcast of your own that you've had uh, right. uh, members on. Um, in fact, I was, I was talking to a senator's office the other day, and they mentioned that you're coming into tape soon, and we'll probably be soon after. So yeah, uh, good. Uh, it'll it'll be good. Um, uh, but thank you for taking the time. Thank you for what you're doing at Heritage. Uh, um, and uh, I think that uh, for the listeners of this podcast, you tend to come from a particular uh, ideological oeuvre. The, the movement that Heritage has had from uh, where it was to today is, is something worth being excited about. Thank you. Um, as a final question, I'll ask you, um, you know, one, when when you first came on this podcast, you said um, in what ended up being the, the last few months of your tenure at TBPF, that your proudest achievement was turning the Texas Public Policy Foundation from what you saw as a, uh, a more libertarian think tank to a conservative one. Um, what's, what is it that in five years um, you would like to have be the legacy of your time at the Heritage Foundation? Excellent question. Thank you. By the way, thanks for letting me think out loud. I, yes, you're right. It, you know, part part of the job is is doing it's the shorter media hits, and I'm very grateful yeah. to be able to do that. But I, I mean this genuinely, as you can tell from my my responses. I I, I like this this opportunity with mm -hmm. you. But to answer your question, success for us five years from now, speaking internally, mm -hmm. and I appreciate the opportunity to do that, would be that all those perceptions that are out there about heritage being conservative ink, about having institutional hubris, about being focused on the wrong questions at the wrong time, that internally we know because of steps that we've taken with wonderful people, I'm gonna be really clear about that, wonderful colleagues have worked and that we can be sitting around our monthly staff meeting, which I've instituted, town hall meetings where people can ask whatever questions are on their mind and we can say we did it and what it would be is that not that we expect people in the movement to say we're perfect that's not the nature of conservative that's okay but to say man when we want to go charge that policy hill when we want to go charge that cultural hill when we want to go elevate a new innovative idea in the movement and we need assistance we know that all we have to do is ask Heritage the question and automatically the answer is yes. It's a good vision. It is. Dr. Roberts, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you, my friend. 
told you guys that that would be pretty interesting. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, as always, please make sure to rate and review this podcast. Five stars really helps us in all of the rankings. You can be sure to watch the video version of this on YouTube or Rumble. Uh, and you can also follow us all on social media at ammoment.org on most platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Getter, etc. Um, thank you guys as always for listening. Uh, we really appreciate it. Go to AmericanMoment.org uh, to find everything we have cooking. And we will see you guys next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more. Thank you.